Intanto buongiorno a tutti quanti, grazie di essere venuti sia in presenza che in collegamento. Questo è la secondo, il secondo incontro del corso multidisciplinare di Roma 3 sull'agenda 2030 delle Nazioni Unite per lo sviluppo sostenibile e in realtà è la prima vera lezione del, che, riguarderà, che riguarderanno i 17 eh, obiettivi dell'agenda 2030. Il primo è stato un incontro introduttivo, abbiamo avuto come ricorderete il, un video del professor Giovannini eh, dell'ASVIS, ora Ministro delle Infrastrutture e delle Mobilità Sostenibili e poi ci sono state tre presentazioni di nostri docenti, il professor De Muro che è qui anche oggi con noi, la professoressa Carletti e il professor Asdrubali. Um, oggi invece abbiamo la prima vera e propria lezione, parliamo di povertà, la povertà infatti è il primo degli obiettivi dei social development um, uh, goals, della, uh, sustainable development goal, goals dell'agenda e abbiamo la uh, professoressa Sabina Alcair dell'Oxford, dell'Università dell di Oxford, in particolare, poi la presenterà molto meglio di me il professor De Muro, ma la sua, eh, diciamo, il suo valore aggiunto come ricercatrice è quello di, di aver contribuito in maniera determinante sulla, oltre che sulle policy per la povertà, soprattutto sulla misurazione della povertà con un approccio multidimensionale. Infatti il titolo della sua lezione di oggi è Adopting a Multidimensional Approach to Poverty e diciamo, multidimensionalità che è perfettamente in linea con la multidisciplinarietà e l'approccio multidisciplinare e multidimensionale appunto dell'agenda di cui abbiamo parlato, di cui parleremo e che ritroveremo sempre sia nelle trasversalità dei diversi obiettivi dell'agenda e sia nella trattazione dei singoli obiettivi. Detto questo, eh, io a questo punto passo la parola al professor De Muro, ringrazio, eh, many thanks to eh, Sabina to being here, Uh, and, and, and having accepted our, our invitation, and now I give the floor to Professor Pasquale De Muro for the introduction. Benvenuti a tutti, studentesse e studenti, colleghe e colleghi, e anche le persone collegate online, naturalmente. E soprattutto benvenuta Sabina Alcaier, welcome Sabina. Oggi oggi iniziamo le lezioni, come diceva il professor De Filippis, e iniziamo dalla povertà, che è l'SDG1. Eh, non per caso è l'obiettivo numero uno. Diciamo che gli obiettivi, gli obiettivi sono in una certa misura anche messi in ordine di importanza. Anche nella precedente agenda delle Nazioni Unite, l'agenda del millennio, che è stata in vigore fra il 2000 e il 2015 e poi è stata sostituita dall'agenda per lo sviluppo sostenibile, l'obiettivo numero uno era la lotta alla povertà, perché appunto è considerato uno delle, diciamo in qualche modo uno delle, dei fenomeni più gravi a livello socio-economico e anche perché ha una dimensione globale molto importante ed ha connessioni, come abbiamo visto già la settimana scorsa, abbiamo eh, connessioni molto importanti di questo obiettivo con una serie di altri obiettivi, quindi non si può sconfiggere la povertà senza perseguire molti altri obiettivi, viceversa eh, perseguire altri obiettivi si può fare soltanto considerando la lotta alla povertà, vi soltanto un collegamento che è meno scontato, anzi due collegamenti che sono meno scontati, eh, per esempio con l'ambiente, nelle zone dove c'è maggiore povertà estrema nel mondo, la presenza di forte povertà in certi gruppi sociali eh, crea una pressione importantissima sulle risorse naturali e eh, porta di solito a un sovrasfruttamento di queste risorse, con un impoverimento molto forte dei suoli, delle foreste, eh, delle risorse ittiche. E quindi è chiaro che il fatto che le persone molto povere non possono che per sopravvivere sfruttare in maniera intensiva le risorse naturali crea una pressione eccessiva in alcuni casi. E quindi se vogliamo... Uh, proteggere le nostre risorse naturali e lasciarle intatte alle generazioni future, dobbiamo anche dare a queste popolazioni dei mezzi di sostentamento alternativi, altrimenti non si riesce a combattere uh, tutta una serie di problematiche ambientali senza combattere lo stesso tempo la povertà, quindi vedete sinergie molto forti. E, mh, la, mh, 
l'aspetto importante della lezione di oggi però non è soltanto questo, ma anche il fatto che eh, tradizionalmente la povertà è stata vista come una privazione eh, di, eh, di risorse materiali e in particolare come privazione di reddito. Anche adesso l'Istat quando valuta in Italia per esempio la povertà considera povere tutte le persone al di sotto di una certa soglia di reddito, in particolare di consumi, comunque eh, molto spesso si usa il reddito. Ecco, questo è l'approccio tradizionale che non sempre è soddisfacente, anche perché appunto in qualche modo non ci permette di identificare molto bene le radici del problema e anche di definire meglio le policy che sono necessarie per combattere queste privazioni. E dunque uno dei motivi per cui abbiamo invitato Sabina Alcaier, che è una delle, delle studiose più importanti a livello internazionale, anzi forse secondo me la più importante, che ha lavorato proprio su ampliare questo approccio verso una considerazione di deprivazioni multiple in ambiti non soltanto eh, materiali, ma anche in altri ambiti, soprattutto quindi con un tentativo di misurare e di identificare i poveri in diverse dimensioni. E vedrete eh, che su questo diciamo, eh, Sabina sicuramente ci presenterà delle, eh, de i risultati delle sue ricerche che sono molto importanti e che sono stati anche adottati a diversi governi. Eh, naturalmente è molto importante, un ultimo motivo per cui questo obiettivo è molto importante è anche perché abbiamo un, uh, un impatto uh, molto forte del Covid su, questi, su questo fenomeno. Eh, proprio l'altro ieri, se non mi sbaglio, l'Istat ha, uh, ha tirato fuori le prime stime dell'impatto del Covid sulla povertà in Italia ed è stato veramente un impatto che non si vedeva, un aumento che non si vedeva da tantissimi anni. Quindi immaginate a livello globale, nei paesi più colpiti, quanto è stato l'impatto e anche di questo eh, il gruppo di ricerca eh, diretto da Sabina su, anche su questo ha lavorato. Infine vorrei fare, visto che oggi è l'8 marzo e chiaramente eh, c'è una connessione fortissima anche con la dimensione di genere, vorrei appunto richiamare le connessioni anche fra la questione della povertà, dell'ambiente e le questioni eh, delle, eh, della parità di genere, delle discriminazioni di genere, perché in molti paesi, ma anche in Italia, eh, la povertà ha un volto femminile, nel senso che la maggior parte dei poveri sono donne. Quindi le donne sono svantaggiate anche da questo punto di vista, è bene ricordarlo, e dunque eh, avere la possibilità di eh, specificamente di considerare il, la, la lotta diciamo, alla discriminazione di genere e alla povertà insieme sono due elementi che non possono che essere considerati simultaneamente. Quindi lottare contro la discriminazione di genere, lottare contro la povertà sono sostanzialmente un obiettivo eh, unito. La professoressa Alcaier, che oggi ha, ci ha fatto la, la cortesia di collegarsi, eh, è molto lontana dall'Italia in questo momento per lavoro, e lavoro l'ha condotta in questo periodo in Bhutan, quindi è collegata dal Bhutan. Lei normalmente lavora a Oxford, ma in questo periodo è in Bhutan perché lei spesso conduce, eh, dirige progetti di ricerca sul campo, proprio diciamo, per valutare la povertà a livello locale e ehm, quindi in questo periodo eh, è lì e quindi ci ha chiesto lei di fare eh, la lezione a quest'ora per il questione di fuso orario. Eh, l'incarico più importante che attualmente ha Sabina, ha avuto molti incarichi importanti, ma l'incarico più importante che ha Sabina attualmente è quello di dirigere l'Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, che è un importante eh, istituto dell'Università di Oxford che si occupa esplicitamente dei problemi di cui parliamo oggi, ed è anche professore al Dipartimento, eh, professore di studi di sviluppo al Dipartimento di Sviluppo Internazionale dell'Università di Oxford. Eh, lei oltre a occuparsi appunto di povertà multidimensionale in termini di analisi ma anche di policy, si occupa di molti, si è occupata e si occupa di molte altre cose collegate ovviamente, come per esempio eh, l'economia del benessere, il capability approach, eh, la misurazione e l'analisi della povertà, lo sviluppo umano e altre cose ancora ha lavorato eh, per, eh, in passato anche per altre, per altre istituzioni accademiche e non solo, per esempio ha lavorato per la Elliott School of International Affairs della George Washington University, eh, ha lavorato per la Global Equity Initiative all'Università di Harvard, per la Human Security Commission e per eh, ehm, la, 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 culture, la Poverty and Culture Learning Research Initiative della Banca Mondiale. Eh, ha un 
un uh, dottorato in uh, economia dall'Università di Oxford e uh, è conosciuta a livello internazionale soprattutto per un suo importantissimo contributo scientifico insieme al, pro al professor Foster ha elaborato e proposto un metodo per misurare la povertà multidimensionale che è ampiamente adottato a livello internazionale ormai, anche dalle Nazioni Unite e dal, dal UNDP in particolare, che è una, uh, un approccio che permette uh, di incorporare le differenti dimensioni della povertà, come abbiamo detto prima, e soprattutto può essere disaggregato per tener conto anche di differenti, di differenti Ehm, gruppi socio-economici, eh, etnie e, e altri altre tipi di segregazioni e soprattutto è una, un indicatore flessibile che si adatta facilmente a diversi contesti a secondo anche dei dati che sono disponibili. Con, ehm, con i suoi colleghi, infatti da poco, voglio ricordare un suo volume proprio su questo argomento, cioè sulla misurazione multidimensionale della povertà, che vi consiglio se siete interessati all'argomento perché sicuramente il testo il testo, uno dei testi più eh, recenti, più importanti di questo, su questo argomento. Questo strumento, eh, appunto, che, la, il cui acronimo lo vedrete nelle slide è MP, MPI, Multiple, eh, Multidimensional Poverty Index, offre un modo per identificare i poveri e quindi per capire anche in quali dimensioni sono, eh, sono deprivati e quali sono quindi i tipi di policy che è necessario eh, implementare per combattere meglio la povertà. Quindi da questo punto di vista abbiamo oggi la fortuna di avere con noi uno dei più importanti studiosi di povertà a livello globale e devo dire che eh, io sono fortunato perché la conosco da diversi anni e per me è stata fonte di ispirazione anche per eh, le mie attività scientifiche e i suoi testi non possono mancare nei miei corsi perché naturalmente sono un pilastro eh, in, questo, in questo filone di ricerca. La lezione di Sabina Alcaier ovviamente sarà in inglese come abbiamo già annunciato Uh, e dopo la sua lezione avremo una sessione di domande e risposte e naturalmente per chi vorrà fare, che non si sente di fare domande in inglese, ehm, tradurremo le domande dall'italiano all'inglese e anche le risposte della, della dottoressa Alcaira. A questo punto non mi, la, non mi resta che dare la parola eh, alla mh, professoressa Alcaira. Sabina, uh, welcome and now you have the floor. Thank you so much, Professor De Muro, Pasquale De Muro, and Professor Filippis, and all of you who have made the time to attend. I look forward very much to our interaction and our exchanges. And I'm grateful and humbled by the kind introduction. And I'm also grateful to Roma Trey University for having this lecture series on the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. I think that it is so important for students like you to really have a good understanding of the aims of the Sustainable Development Goals and also of the mechanisms by which we can advance them. So clearly, as Professor De Muro said, today I will focus on the first Sustainable Development Goal, which is ending poverty in all its forms anywhere. As you know, there are 17 goals, and this is the first of them. And it is not only the first goal in terms of 17 co-equal goals, but although there are no priorities between the SDGs, there is some indication that poverty is so important in a normative and ethical sense that it has a recognition of its importance. So the document in 2015 that established the Sustainable Good Development Goals is called Transforming Our World. And its opening preamble, its opening paragraph says, we recognize that eradi eradicating poverty in all its forms and dimensions, including extreme poverty, which is their word for monetary poverty, is the greatest global challenge and an indispensable requirement for sustainable development. So there are two things to notice. As Professor de Muro said, traditionally poverty has been measured in a monetary sense, but the sustainable development goals for the first time in international documents define poverty from the beginning to have multiple forms and dimensions. 
and we will talk more about that. The second point to notice is that the phrase, it's the greatest global challenge. It's an indispensable requirement for sustainable development. That gives the work to end poverty a kind of moral or ethical um, urgency that perhaps we must respect. So as you know, there are 17 goals, 169 targets, and 232 indicators. Goal one has five targets. One is focused on ending monetary poverty, measured by $1.90 a day. The second is focused on multidimensional poverty. We will discuss that later. The third is on having social protection, like unemployment benefits, maternity leave, um, and so on for all pensions. The fourth is making sure there is gender equity in access to resources and services, blotting out racism and discrimination so everybody has an equal chance. And the last is supporting particularly the poor and the vulnerable when there is climate change, when there is war, when there is an economic crisis or a pandemic. So these are the five components of the first sustainable development goal. As I said, we will mainly focus on the second of the five, but before we go there, I will give you a brief update on the others. And this draws on the 2020 Sustainable Development Report of the Secretary General of the United Nations. In terms of monetary poverty, it has reduced um, from 36.4% back in 1990 to 15.7% in 2010, to 10% in 2015, to 8.2% in 2019. And that is based on now casting or predictions uh, from the World Bank. But then came COVID. And so the World Bank now predicts that 71 million people have fallen into poverty in 2020 because of the pandemic. Furthermore, this is the first time in 30 years that extreme monetary poverty has increased. If you think, what is 71 million people? India has 60, sorry, it's Italy has 60 million. So it's like more than the country of Italy going now to live on less than $1.90 a day. Also, if you think of monetary poverty, young people are twice as likely to be poor. So like yourselves, um, it's not just affecting the very old people, but also young people who can work, who are educated and yet are income poor. And just a couple um, other numbers. In terms of social protection, more than half of the globe did not have social protection in 2016, the most recent year for which we have data. And also in 2018, the cost simply of natural disasters um, was the natural disasters created a loss of. Uh, 23.6 billion US dollars. So the other aspects of SDG 1 are important and they also deserve attention. But today I'd like to focus on the second one, which is the aim to reduce at least by half the proportion of men, women and children. As Professor DeMuro said, women and the gendered focus is very important, of all ages, living in multidimensional poverty. So we will first think about what is multidimensional poverty. Then we will talk about this feature of national definitions. But because we cannot in one hour 
cover 100 countries individually, we will then focus on a global measure that can be compared across 107 countries and talk through that. So that's the plan. So I, I wish that we were together in one place, that we could not be interactive instead of on Zoom, because I would ask you, what is poverty? And one person would say money, but another person would say not being able to eat. Another person would say children out of school. Another person would say not having a safe childbirth or not having a job or being disempowered or not having good housing. And this is actually interesting because when we begin to think about poverty, we should not think as experts because we, you and I, are not the experts on poverty. The experts on poverty are the people who live it day in and day out. So our first step must be to listen. As Amartya Sen said in the idea of justice 2009, what tends to inflame the mind of suffering humanity cannot but be of immediate interest, must be of immediate interest to policy and to our definition of injustice. So my research center, like many others, does this. We go and we listen. And I do encourage you, if you go into development, into economics, um, to also spend time listening in different villages, in slums, in areas to the wisdom of the protagonists of poverty. For example, there was a two-year study done in El Salvador in Central America to understand how different communities understood poverty. So Vladimir from Kumasangwa said, People only go to hospital when there is emergency and they may not have the money for the bus that will take them to the clinic. Isabel um, was in a slum where there was a kind of a, a, a mafia, a, a gang. And so she said that people often think of poverty as only about money and things that you can buy. But for her, it was also about violence. She had to go and lock her door at only four or five in the afternoon and pray that she would be safe. At the time when she spoke, El Salvador was the homicide capital of the world. There were more people killed in handgun violence um, than anywhere else in the world. Because of voices like hers, the government of El Salvador put violence into its poverty measure, something it had not planned to do. So with your support, with your listening, you can amplify the voices of these experts on poverty and bring them to decision makers. So what actually happened was that we listened, they listened, um, and they linked what poor people articulated as aspects of poverty to things that could be measured. For example, somebody said, the day I went out, I got robbed. So crime became an indicator in their multidimensional poverty index. Children spoke of not being able to continue their studies. And so school attendance became an indicator. Um, the problem of finding somebody to care for the children so that women could work was a problem. And so child services went in to their multidimensional poverty measure. The point is that when people who live poverty talk about it, they don't talk only about money. Yes, money is part of the problem, but it's not the whole picture. I've given you examples from El Salvador, but this has been done hundreds of times in different countries at different periods. And again and again, 
although the definitions vary across Sub-Saharan Africa or Mongolia or Nepal, what is common is that something besides money matters to poor people and also something money cannot buy. They cannot buy a school and a teacher if there is no school or the teacher. It takes really a government investment, a bigger kind of investment um, to solve some of these problems of services. So one reason that we look at poverty in multiple dimensions is to try to make our measures match the understanding of poverties that people have. So there is already a monetary poverty measure and we need it, we value it. But alongside that, we want to build a measure that's more direct and that really targets these different aspects of food and housing and safety and schooling. But there's one more important thing we find out when we listen deeply to the protagonists of poverty. And that is that they are not passive. They are active. They are our allies. They themselves are trying to reduce their poverty. And I mention this because sometimes when you see people on television, they might just be sitting and you think, oh, we have to help them. But actually, it's not quite like that. For example, a major study at the World Bank asked poor people who had moved out of poverty, what was the most important reason that you were able to move out of poverty? Was it the government programs? Was it your aunt or your kin, your relative in the city? Was it your church, your faith-based group? Was it that you worked really hard? Was it that you had savings? Was it that you stole something or you had drug money? Was it luck? No. 77% of the people said that it was my initiative. That was the most important reason. Government programs help. Kin networks help. NGOs, faith-based groups, they all help. But the agency, the activity of the poor people is needed to bring these different things together and to use them to leave poverty. It's very important not to forget that. And so, as Professor de Moro mentioned, I've drawn for years on the work of Amartya Sen, Nobel laureate in economics because his understanding of poverty and of the protagonists of poverty, the poor people, is very similar. But he's an economist, and so you can use him in academic work. He developed something called the capability approach. He said, we don't want to give everybody equal amounts of bread because one person might be pregnant, one person might be very old and sit, one person might be an athlete. One person might have a low metabolism. One person might be al allergic to bread. So if we give them equal amounts of bread, they will have different amounts of nutrition. So actually we need to give them, we need to make sure that there is equal equality between their functionings and also that they are free to choose what they value. So when it comes to poverty, he also recommended a multidimensional approach. He said that human lives are battered and diminished in many different kinds of ways. And so when we come to measure poverty, our measures need to acknowledge this. The other reason Amartya Sen has had a very strong voice in development is that he supports the dignified agency of the poor people. In 1998, he won the Nobel Prize, and then he published his book, The Development as Freedom. 
And there he said, people, including poor people, should be viewed as masters of their own destiny, the same language as liberation theology, and not as passive victims of cunning development projects. And I want to mention that because the rest of this hour, we will talk about policy and measurement. But please never forget that policy is only part of the story. The empowered, dignified agency of poor men, women, and children is the other part of the story. But policy is important. So my last introductory slide is this. And it comes from an article that Amartya Sen wrote in April of last year. Um, he is still a professor at Harvard. And it was during the pandemic. And people were quite afraid because it was early. And they also were afraid that poverty would go up a lot. So he told a story. It's a true story. And it's a story about World War II. And it's about England and Wales in the United Kingdom. And in the 1930s, life expectancy had risen by 1.2 years across a decade. So it had gone up by 1.2 years. In the 1940s, there was World War I. Of course, World War I led to deaths of young people. It also led to impoverishment. The supply lines were not there. And so there was an expectancy that life expectancy during the decade of the 40s would go down. But what happened was interesting and simple. Notice how simple it was. The food supply went down. And so Britain rationed the food. They made it an, a more equal amount of flour and sugar and oil and butter and these things. And as a result, although on mass the food supply went down, life expectancy went up 6.5 years for men and seven years for women. So his question to us was during the COVID pandemic, with simple policies, that also respect the dignified agency of the impoverished. Can we actually not just prevent poverty from increasing, but actually bring poverty down, increase life expectancy, increase education, increase these different things? It's a very important question, and I'm going to end with a similar story. But first, let's move to measurement. Now, I want to explain one thing, um, which is that there are two kinds of measures, whether you are talking about income or whether you are talking about multidimensional poverty measures. One measure is national, and that means it reflects what poverty means. Poverty in Italy is very different than poverty in Bhutan, or poverty in Madagascar, or poverty in uh, Japan. So the income poverty lines will be different, for example. Countries have their own poverty lines, and we call them national. What it means is that it is appropriate for Italy, but then you cannot compare Italy to Madagascar because the lines are different. They define poverty differently. And yet for policy purposes and for the sustainable development goals, we need these national MPIs. In comparison, the $1.90 a day measure is the same across the world. It's $1.90 a day whether you are in the United States or in Italy or in Madagascar or in um, Indonesia or in Taiwan. So that is a comparable measure. So in the same way that we have comparable measures for monetary poverty, we have them for multidimensional poverty. 
So the one I will present is a global multidimensional poverty index. And so it uses the same definition for every country. But it means that you can compare across countries and you can learn um, how different countries reduced the same indicators over time. But for the MPI, we also have, though I will not present today, many national MPIs, which are tailor-made to each country. The United States, for example, has an MPI as an alternative poverty measure. So does Palestine, so does Ghana, South Africa, Afghanistan, Mexico, uh, Sierra Leone, uh, Angola. Many countries have national MPIs, but they are each different and each of them are designed for their own data sets and situations. In terms of SDG 1, the countries report their national MPIs against the SDG indicator 1.2.2. 64 countries managed to report, but we know a number of countries who have their MPIs but have not yet reported them because it's still very new. So I will not talk more about national MPIs here, but I wanted you to know that they exist. The reason I wanted you to know that is that governments are very excited to have national MPIs and they use them. They use them to set their budget. They use them to coordinate between different ministries. They use them to target poor groups. For example, in Panama, um, some groups had 91% of their people being poor, whereas other regions had 4% of their people being poor. So you target the poorest regions. We have a network of 60 countries who use their MPIs and they speak at UN General Assembly. And we have heads of state. Um, the last meeting had the president of Chile, the prime minister of Pakistan, the president of Afghanistan, uh, the prime minister of Nepal, the president of Costa Rica, the vice president of Ecuador, many leaders talking about using measures of poverty to fight poverty, to develop policies. And indeed, Sanya Nishtar, the Minister of Poverty Alleviation in Pakistan, said during COVID, there will be a lot of investment in supporting the poor and the vulnerable. And so let's use this season of COVID, just like they used World War II in Britain to make an inflection point to turn a corner on poverty and actually reduce it against all odds. So what I will do for the rest of the time is present one example of a multidimensional measure, which is a global measure. Now you are students and you might have a research project on Nigeria or on the Philippines or some other country. All of what I will present here is online, as are much more Excel and PDFs of each country. Um, do files for those of you who are quantitative and want to replicate our computations and infographics in different languages. At present, we also have a MOOC, a massive open online course in English, French and Spanish, where um, you can go for free to have short lectures and to learn more about how to use uh, national and global MPIs. So the global MPI is a joint product between our research center at the University of Oxford and the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. And we started it in 2010. It has three dimensions, health, education and living standards. They are the same three dimensions as the Human Development Index, for those of you who know that. And it has 10 indicators. Now listen to these and see if you think they reflect poverty. What are they missing? 
you are deprived if anybody in your household is undernourished. You are deprived if a child has died in the last five years in your household. You are deprived if nobody in your household has completed six years of schooling so they can read or write for the family. You are deprived if any child is not attending school up to the age at which they would complete class eight. You are deprived if you do not have clean cooking fuel, but you cook with wood or dung or charcoal. You are deprived if you do not have adequate sanitation, safe drinking water, if you do not have electricity, or if your housing materials are natural or rudimentary, things like bamboo or dirt or cardboard or plastic. And you are deprived if you do not have more than one of a small set of assets, telephone, television, radio, computer, bicycle, motorcycle, animal cart, refrigerator. And if you have a car or a truck, you are not deprived in assets. So these are the 10 indicators of the global MPI. Each dimension is equally weighted and each indicator within a dimension is equally weighted. So health and education indicators weigh one sixth and living standard indicators weigh one eighteenth. Each of these indicators is linked to the sustainable development goals. What is new, and the MPI is the only of the 232 indicators to do this, is that the MPI shows who is deprived in several SDG indicators at the same time. So those are the sustainable development goals that are linked to the MPI. And you will hear more about these other goals other weeks of this series. So any poverty measure, as Professor DeMuro said, identifies who is poor. In the case of the MPI, I am poor if I am deprived in at least one third of these weighted indicators. So any two health or education indicators or three living standard indicators and one health or educated education indicator, for example. So let me give you an example. This is Nahato. She is three years old and she is in Uganda and she's very cute. And one of our students took the case study. This is her home. It is made of poles and mud, so she is deprived in housing. But she's not deprived in electricity because she has one light bulb and it's charged by solar energy. And solar energy is also used to charge her mother's cell phone. This is her mother, Nambubi. She's 38 years old and she has 10 children. Um, they are deprived in school attendance because they cannot afford the school fees. You have to pay $2.75 for four months of schooling and they cannot afford that. Think of that for a moment. This is now, this is 2020, 2021. So people really do experience these conditions. And even though the MPI does not include work, we know that Numbubi goes and works often 12 hours a day in the field. Um, we also know she's often worried about food. But sometimes when you only talk about difficulties, you miss out what's really important about people's lives. So when we visited Nahato and her family, we noticed they were not afraid. They were smiling, they were outgoing and confident. So their mother had done really well with them. And they also had a lot of joy and they didn't have a radio, but their neighbors had a radio. And sometimes their neighbors would turn on the radio and then they'd dance at night. And they really enjoyed that. 
So whenever we go and learn from the protagonists of poverty, we cannot just see them as poor. They're human beings and they have creativity and joy and depth as well. But when we come to measure poverty, we find that yes, there was malnutrition in Nahato's household. Yes, siblings were out of school. They cooked with wood. Their water was not safe um, and their housing was deprived. So she and her family are multidimensionally poor. They're identified as poor because their deprivation score, if you add up those indicators, is 50%. She's deprived in half of the indicators and that's more than one third. It doesn't tell the whole story of her life, but it tells the part. Let's move now to India. This is Amuda in South India. And she's 14 years old and she goes to school and she has a school uniform. So she wanted to wear it for her picture. As you can see on the right, her family cooks with wood. And they don't have many assets. Their housing is dirt. Um, and their drinking water is not from a protected source. So her deprivation score is 44%. It's less than Nahato's. It's not 50%, it's 44%, but it's still more than 33%. So she's identified as poor. Are you with me? So that's the first step. Then this is the only slide with an equation, and it's only multiplication. So don't go to sleep yet, because I'm going to show you some interesting results. But we've identified everybody now in Italy, everybody in um, India, everybody in Uganda as poor or non-poor. And the other thing is that for every poor person, we have their deprivation score, 50% or 44%. So what do we do? We look at the percentage of people who are poor, that's H, the headcount ratio, or the incidence of poverty. Like 33% of people, let's say, are poor. Um, and we multiply it by the average deprivation score of poor people. We call it the intensity of their poverty. And that's how we make a measure. I won't go into it more, but for those of you who are economists, mathematicians, statisticians, sociologists, you should know that multidimensional poverty measurement is not as complicated as you might think. So I put this slide in because this is a slide by Sir Tony Atkinson, who was an advisor to our research center. And he began to study poverty in 1969. And his last book, which was published after, sadly, he died, um, was also on poverty. And he was talking about global poverty. And it sounds serves as a warning to all of us if we decide to work on measurement. He says poverty measurement is different from measuring anything else because the measures have to motivate us to action, to tackle the challenge of poverty. Remember that ending poverty, SDG 1, is the greatest global challenge. So how do we use the MPI that I just showed you for action? So I'm going to show some results from the most recent uh, 2020 update of the global MPI. And it covers 107 countries and 5.9 billion people. Um, so that is just to give an idea. It's um, over 75%, it's 77% of the people on the planet um, and over 90% of people living in developing countries. And I'll also show you some changes, reductions in poverty over time for 5 billion people. So remember that according to the $1.90 a day measure, 8.2% of people were poor. But if you now think of the MPI, 1.3 billion people which is 23% of the population are multidimensionally poor. 
they're deprived in one third or more of the deprivations. So it's a lot more people. Of those 1.3 billion people, half of them are children. They have not yet celebrated their 18th birthday. Two thirds of them do not live in low income countries, but they live in middle income countries, mainly in South Asia and Sub Saharan Africa, and mainly in rural areas. Now, I talked about multidimensional poverty, and I talked about how poor people described it, but what do we find when we measure it? We also find that it is real. Of those 1.3 billion people, 99% of them are not just undernourished, malnourished, not just without water, not just with a child attending school. 99% of them have at least three deprivations at the same time. And 83 and a half have five or more deprivations at the same time. So this is very real and it helps us to understand the, the busy and the stressful lives that poor people experience. So just to probe these findings a little bit more, I mentioned that half of the poor people are children. And this is really quite striking because in the developing world, one in three children are poor. So if you have three children, one's poor, but it's only one in six adults. So we really need to think about the children because the poverty is marking their lives for many years to come. And that's the case in every single of the 10 indicators. Also, the World Bank finds that over 60% of the poor people are in Sub-Saharan Africa and far fewer in South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and so on. But we find that South Asia has a lot of poor people as well as Sub-Saharan Africa. And I mentioned policy. How do you use the MPI? Um, one reason that it is very popular and many countries have used it is that it not only tells you what percentage of people are poor, but it tells you how they are poor by each indicator. And so if you are in a community and you need to fight poverty, you need to know where do you put your money, your energy, your love to change the situation. And the MPI helps to do that. So for example, these are two countries, Madagascar and Mali um, in Africa, and they have similar levels of poverty. But you can see that the colors are different. So without going into the details, we know that you have to spend more, for example, on school attendance in Mali or on assets in Madagascar. You also might ask, well, is monetary poverty and MPI, are they similar? And what we find is that actually there's quite a difference in terms of the percentage of people who are poor by each of the measures. The black dots are the percentage of people who are monetary poor and the beige lines are the percentage of people who are multidimensionally poor. And it's usually quite different. So I've shown comparisons across countries. I won't take time to go into this, but let's say you are doing a research project on one of those 107 countries like Bangladesh. You can go to our website and click on a country briefing and it will give you all of the details of Bangladesh. So for example, in Bangladesh, one in four people are poor and their average deprivation score is 42%. And then rural areas are more poor than rural areas. And you can see how each of the indicators contribute to poverty. You can also look across the regions of Bangladesh 
and see that in some regions, it's 37% of people who are poor, and in others, it's 16%. By the way, you cannot do this for $1.90 a day poverty. It cannot be disaggregated by geographic regions. So that is a little bit of the kinds of insights that come from the global multidimensional poverty measure. And what is important is that we are able to compare many different countries. For example, if we look at Africa, in Niger and South Sudan, over 90% of people are poor. In Tanzania and Nigeria, it's around half. In Zimbabwe and Ghana, it's around a quarter. In Tunisia or the Seychelles, it's very low. So the MPI enables us to compare many, many different situations at the national level. But it also helps us to compare subnational regions and see how across even borders um, at a, a very micro level, poverty might be different or similar. And this is of great interest to people working on poverty in these different areas. For each of these regions, we know the composition of poverty by indicator. But, and this is important, we have this information in order to try to reduce poverty. So the last slides are on how countries are doing this. I mentioned that we had trends for 5 billion people, and they live in 75 countries. And 65 of those countries reduced their MPI statistically significantly. And the fastest reduction was in Sierra Leone, Mauritania, and Liberia, three countries in Africa. What this slide shows is that these are the 10 indicators of the MPI, and they reduced MPI very fast, but they all did it differently. Sierra Leone reduced nutrition a lot. Mauritania put, um, child, had years of schooling reductions that were very big, and Liberia had a lot more children in school. So countries have their own way of becoming successful at reducing the MPI. We also find very happily that the region called Silhet at the bottom right of this graphic was the poorest region in Bangladesh in 2014. But Silhet also had the fastest reduction of poverty. You will hear throughout this seminar series of the importance of leaving no one behind. When the poorest region has the fastest progress, they are not being left behind, they are catching up. And that's what happened in Bangladesh. Silhat caught up. So if we go back, um, Silhat is no longer the poorest region in Bangladesh. So that's a success. We also find that monetary poverty and multidimensional poverty do not go down at the same speed. So you need them both. You need two eyes to see poverty properly. So finally, I'd like to talk briefly about COVID. So the data that we have for the global MPI and for most national MPIs are from before the pandemic. Although I will mention one, the first, country with data after the pandemic. So we wanted to know how has poverty changed globally and the United Nations wanted us to share that information. So we used predictions from the World Food Programme and from UNESCO about increases in nutrition and in children out of school. And what we found was that Probably the global MPI has been set back between three and 10 years. 
because of the COVID pandemic. That's the prediction. But hang on. Remember World War II? Remember England and Wales and Amartya and Sen's story? It's not a prediction, it's a call to action. We want to call to you, to leaders of countries, to leaders of businesses. Please let's work together to make sure this does not happen. Let's make sure that poverty is not set back three to 10 years, that hundreds of millions of people do not fall into poverty. Let's act now and be their voice so that their views and their well being become and stay priorities. Countries did this. When Colombia was hit by the pandemic, within two weeks, it integrated its MPI data with its health data, and that was part of its COVID response. And it had data for every block from the census. So I'm gonna end with one story. And that story comes from Sierra Leone. You remember that we did trends in global MPI for 75 countries and 65 reduced poverty. And the fastest was Sierra Leone. But the period that Sierra Leone reduced poverty, the fastest of all of these countries was 2013 to 2017. But in 2013, the Ebola pandemic struck Sierra Leone. And in 2017, they were declared free of the Ebola pandemic. During those four years, poverty went down from 74%, nearly three quarters of the population, to 58%. Now, it was not perfect in Sierra Leone. People had to make decisions very fast. They didn't understand Ebola at the time. They needed to put in hand washing. They needed to take children out of school. Many of these pandemic responses. And there was tragedy and people did die. And yet Sierra Leone shows us that despite all of the messiness of their pandemic, they did bring poverty down. So we use this example to request other countries to do the same during the COVID pandemic, to make a step change in how much we care about and prioritize poverty, and to try to use this as England did during the World War II, not just not to prevent poverty from increasing, but actually to reduce it. And you will have heard the trillions of dollars that countries are spending in the COVID pandemic. What if these were wisely spent for the poor? Could we end this kind of deprivation? So the opening sentence of the Sustainable Development Goals recognizes eradicating poverty to be the greatest global challenge and an indispensable requirement for sustainable development. And that was before the COVID pandemic. Now, in the middle of it, it is even more important that all of us draw together to fight this challenge. And you might be students, you might think, what can I do? But many hands make light work. And so by working together, by informing ourselves, by raising these issues, um, we can hopefully start to turn this corner. I hope very much that in your work, in your research, in your other classes, you'll continue to have an interest in multidimensional poverty, to use the data that are online for your own um, projects, and also perhaps to study these topics later. It's an area that needs many committed hands and minds, not all of them quantitative, but also qualitative, artistic, musical, and other ways. So thank you so very much. Um, that's all from me. Thank you very much, Sabina, for this great, inspiring presentation. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Sono tutti due attivati.
Sì, sì, ma io il microfono, però deve sentirmi, lei non mi sente. Sì, è attivata. Ma il microfono, dico. Okay. Thank you, Sabina. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you okay. well. Thank you. Thank you very much for this inspiring presentation. Now we will have uh, a Q&A session. So I will uh, ask you uh, the questions that some students have already uh, written in the, in the, in the chat uh, window. So, of course, I, um, tutti gli studenti sono incoraggiati, a, anche qui quelli presenti, a fare domande. Io leggo adesso un paio di domande che sono arrivate online e poi do la parola qua in aula, va bene? Allora, diamo anche attenzione a quelli che ci hanno seguito finora da lontano. Allora, c'è una prima domanda di Cristina. Anzi, no, una domanda sì, di Cristina che scrive um, Sometimes it seems that people who are considered poor have a happier attitude towards life than us. Maybe because they don't take anything for granted. So I want to, do, to ask you if and what have you learned from their approach to life? Thank you so much, Christina. And it's a wonderful question. We cannot generalize. So some people who are poor are bitter and angry. Some people are just depressed and in a lot of pain. So we cannot generalize that people are happier than we are or vice versa. There's diversity. But what you say is true, that sometimes there is a kind of mental resilience and strength. For example, I was in Nepal um, with a man who had been supporting the Prime Minister of Nepal as his advisor. And he was translating our interview. We were interviewing somebody who is poor by the global MPI. And he commented that she's smiling. So at the end of the interview, we asked her, why is she so happy? And uh, we'd spent by that time several hours with her and longer in the community. And she said, well, I have what I need. Now she was poor, she had a house, but it was very rudimentary. Um, she went to pick what wood from the forest to sell, but the forest had rhinoceros, which were dangerous. Um, so she had a quite difficult life. But she said, my daughter is about to get married. I'm so excited. She was a very spiritual person and she just radiated joy. And my translator, who was again of his himself an eminent policymaker, said, Sabina, yesterday we were in the capital city. We were about to go to a press conference. We were stuck in traffic. I was so nervous. I had a stress, very stressful time. And this woman who has nothing has reminded me that I need to be grateful, that I can be happy. And so I think it, it's an interesting conversation. I am in Bhutan. Bhutan has a gross national happiness index. And if you look at the map of Bhutan and you look at where the poor are by the MPI, it's not always different from where the happiest people are. So sometimes in rural communities where there is peace, strong cultural traditions, strong love and community feelings. There might be poverty, but um, very strong mental and relational well-being. Other places, it's not like that. So I think we need to look at both and try to advance both, um, but still giving poverty a priority. Amartya Sen worries that we will only look at happiness, but if a person has warm socks and a good roof, she will not be less happy. Um, and so we must make sure that the miserable millionaires do not get policy priorities uh, instead of, of poverty. But I think looking at both of these in a balanced mm -hmm. way and learning from people who have such mental resilience that COVID has not hurt them in the way that it hurt and depressed many of us. I think that's a very interesting conversation. Over. Thank you, Sabina. Sabina, I am Fabrizio. There is another uh, question from Julia on the chat. While, while talking about the African little girl, uh, 
you said that his, uh, he, he, her mother has a cell phone, as a cell phone. At the same time, uh, we have seen them not having a real house, not being able to attend school and, and so on. So my question is how they can afford a cell phone or even worry about having one while not being able to face some basic needs. Um, is cell phone really necessary for them? And what can be possible be its use? And moreover, how can they afford to buy a cell phone or to pay for calls and messages? Now, that's a very good question, Julia. When we say cell phone, we might be thinking of an iPhone that's very expensive. But if you get a very basic cell phone that just does SMS or calls, it often costs $2 um, because the prices of the international agencies are different. So it doesn't even cost there what it costs in other countries. They have differential pricing. Um, and often you can get them used. Cell phones are not used like we are to chat a, lo a long time. They're primarily used with SMS rather than calls because SMS is cheaper. And there's one reason, which is market prices. So knowing when to sell your goods, um, getting the accurate prices comes by cell phone. But also if you have a family in a different village or different, if your husband is working somewhere, then you can SMS to keep in touch. Um, so they're not used a lot. Um, but they are used in a very different ways than we use them. Um, and so that's a part of the coverage of cell phones, but also part of the difficulties. Low batteries, not having power, not having enough money on the cell phone. Those are common problems. Um, and yet many places, um, people including the impoverished people do have one. Over. Thank you very much. Now there are there are some class. Uh, see, prima we have to la mano. Ah, lei, lei. Prego, venga. Um, hello, Sabina. This is Guilherme. I'm from Brazil. Thank you for your lecture. And my question is, how do you see the the trap of the a huge? Um, improve of the poverty in Brazil in the field next years. We are seeing the, the effect of the pandemic situation in Brazil. It's very, very sad. And unfortunately, in the next few years, maybe next month, next month, next next semester, I guess, um, we will we'll have a huge um, um, improve of the poverty. How do you see that? And what can be done, um, not about the, the government of Brazil, but the international um, organizations? What can be done? Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And I think we are all worried about Brazil. I think it's a place where um, the COVID pandemic, of course, affects uh, people in different ways. One is that the informal jobs are often the ones that go and that have gone with the COVID. Um, also, food insecurity, therefore, has gone up. Um, intergenerational households may have lost somebody. So the, the direct effects of the COVID pandemic, which, as you mentioned, are, are strong in Brazil, um, will themselves already have a difficult impact on the poor overcrowding, you know, and also um, from talking with friends who work there, you know, there it, it is besides poverty, it's also the violence that has increased somewhat. And so there's concerns about that, although maybe during the pandemic it has not increased further, which would be good. Um, there are different strands that complement the government's actions, which is what you were asking. One is with the private sector. So, for example, in Costa Rica, um, the private sector are identifying which of their um, employees are poor using a voluntary survey with strong ethical pr protections for their employees. So there's not embarrassment. But then if they are identified as poor, then the companies are helping to redress their poverty. And that builds loyalty to the firm 
it increases the retention of good staff. Um, it creates a kind of solidarity and there are positive effects and the cost is not tremendous. So that's one way that the business sector is engaging in reducing poverty. Um, and in terms of international agencies, of course, Brazil is a very mature economy and country. Um, and so anything that outside groups do need to be um, done, you know, alongside the Brazilian experts from different sectors of the society. Um, but sometimes there are particular gaps that can be filled um, by programs that, that are catalytic. And that seems to be the most appropriate um, spaces where, where international groups join in that kind of a context where it's not giving basic budget support. Brazil doesn't have that kind of a, a need, but, but specific uh, inputs over. Thank you very much, Sabina. Uh, uh, ci sono altre domande dalla platea? Se no andiamo sulle domande online che abbiamo tante. Volevo dire a tutti quelli collegati online che abbiamo avuto tante domande, sono molto, siamo molto contenti di questo. Non so se riusciremo a, a farle, diciamo, rivolgerle tutte alla professoressa Cagliari. Vado in ordine di come sono arrivate. Um, la prima che vedo um, riguarda, riguarda, no, c'è... Cioè, um, una domanda da una persona però che non abbiamo il nome. The question is, why does a mud house in Nigeria is not considered housing? I had decent housing. No, that's a good, that's a good question because there, were, there are some cultures in which, for example, an indigenous group like the Bedouin will live in a tent that's very high quality and it will have a dirt floor, but gorgeous carpets on the floor. Um, others, because of their cultural identity, they want rammed brick housing, which is perhaps not considered improved. So there are two strategies for this. In terms of the global MPI, if the only deprivation that you have is that you have a kacha, a, you know, a dirt house, and you're not deprived in anything else, your deprivation score is 5.5%. That's less than 33%, so you're not poor. You're not vulnerable. So we voluntary deprivations one by one will not identify a person as poor and that permits a measure in a sense to navigate some of these cultural and environmental differences if indeed um, the person in Nigeria or anywhere else does not um, understand that condition to be as li linked with poverty but if there's a critical mass of deprivations one third or more then they are identified the second strategy as I mentioned, is to have national measures um, where they would identify perhaps a different set of housing materials as being deprived. And these might change every decade. For example, in Bhutan in 2010, they identified unprotected pit latrines as being sufficient because in the high climate, cold climates, um, they did not feel they needed the protected latrines. But now, 10 years later, they're changing that and they're requiring protected or flush latrines. And so standards change in national MPIs to reflect the different uh, contexts. So those are the two strategies, a mathematical strategy and um, a national strategy. Thank you, Sabina. Now there is a question from uh, Roberta. Uh, Roberta is uh, worried about uh, the problem of uh, uh, she says sexual education. Uh, she she is uh, as the same uh, concern as uh, uh, Mr. Maltus. She uh, she says less children could mean more resources available to the actual population of the country. Don't you think that maybe it's more efficient to prevent too many childbirth than facing the problems caused by child poverty? Yes, no, that's a very good question. And we do every year raise the issue of population growth because um, of the countries that reduced MPI statistically significantly, a number of them had an increase in the number of poor, although there was a decrease in the percentage of poor people. And that's because of population growth. It overwhelmed. And so even though poverty has gone down, you need more money because you have more poor people. 
Um, so we raise that problem each year. Now, what is the best solution? As you said, Amartya Sen, but many others would say education of the woman, not only sexual education, but just a wider education so that she might take up other job opportunities or that she might have uh, higher aspirations. That seems to be key. Obviously, access to contraceptive materials and to the ability to negotiate with one's partner is all, are also key. And those have to do with different cultural institutions in different places. Um, and so changing the norms. But uh, the coercive policies uh, perhaps are not as empowering. And so education uh, does seem to be a very good way forward. It has to be done within the bounds of the culture so you do not endanger the teachers who are giving it. Because if they come in and they give something and the, the community rebels against them, actually they, they might be in danger. And so that has to be done very carefully in different contexts, but it is vital um, to end child poverty. Thank you very much. Now, uh, there is a very long question from uh, the name, from Piero, uh, Pietro, uh, uh, the, describing the very sharp differences that there is in the uh, reaction also to pandemic with uh, concerning poverty in uh, Italy, a difference from Northern Italy, that is richer and Southern Italy. So the, in, the nut, in a nutshell, the question is, in countries where there are so big differences in social and economic difference, is this a problem in me measuring poverty uh, at uh, country level? Yes. So the good news is that with disaggregated data, often the MPI is able to bring out those differences. And the sustainable development goals have an emphasis on leaving no one behind. So on making the fastest progress in the poorest regions. And so the MPI therefore often becomes a tool to target the poorest regions or the poorest social groups or households with disability. Um, and make sure that their progress is addressed, both because it's the right thing to do and for national unity to prevent division, even conflict, it's necessary not to have inequalities exacerbated. Um, and so I think that that's, it's a very good point. Um, but I think of the north and the south of Nigeria, where the north is poorer, or the north and south of Punjab and Pakistan, the biggest province where the north is a lot less poor. Uh, but the MPI has made visible these disparities in levels of poverty so that the, the leadership can talk about them and figure out how to redress them. And the sustainable development goals often help because that principle of leaving no one behind is perhaps the most important principle that the sustainable development goals articulate. And because of that, countries are having to take that seriously. So I think that's one of the most important benefits that the sustainable goals have brought, um, the need for disaggregated data and for attention to the poorest uh, groups within a country. Thank you, Sabina. I hope you can be with us for uh, 10 more minutes for because yes, there yes. are so many questions. Thank you very much. So I now I read the question um, from a colleague of Roma 3. Professor Cristiana Carletti asked you, dear Professor Alcayer, thank you so much for your presentation and your excellent work on the poverty issue at large. My question concerns the targets and indicators of SDG 1 in spite of the impact of the pandemic. Do you believe that after long negotiations to formulate them, COVID-19 requires for proper amendments in order to measure a new poverty multidimensional perspective strictly linked to the basic health conditions worldwide? Oh, thank you so much, Professor Cristina Castell. Um, I don't know, but I do know that we are honored to work with the World Health Organization. So OFI, our research center, are working with WHO, and they, of course, have much better health data. And so they are merging in their health inequality database 
they're merging their data and the non-health aspects of the MPI, basically to see if there are richer health data, if the picture of poverty is very different. Um, so that's a work in progress. We can't um, consider it concluded. But we can also say that uh, the only way we could enrich the health variables would be to have that kind of a partnership, because in the surveys that we use, the demographic and health surveys and the multiple indicator cluster surveys, there are not measures that could improve the health indicators that exist for over 75 countries and 3.5 billion people. Those are our requirements for any new indicator. They have to be available for 75 countries and 3.5 billion people. And whether it's chronic health conditions, whether it's um, uh, anemia, um, other things, we, we don't have data for that critical mass. So um, it would be a matter of partnership going forward. But I think that the good thing is that with the COVID pandemic, these partnerships are forming and a lot of empirical work is being done behind the scenes so that we can understand better either to validate the MPI or to supplement it, what are the possible and the feasible steps forward. Um, and that's very important because it's, it's, it's the pandemic, but it's also the comorbidities and it's also the health infrastructure, all of which are vitally important now, we know, and, and will remain important in the years to come. Thank you. A question um, from Marta that I like very much this question, which country inspired you the most in your researches and which left you the best memory? Also, <laughs> she said, I would really like uh, to thank you for your inspiring and beautiful class. You have opened the new horizons in my previous view of what poverty is. Oh, thank you very much, Marta. Um, I'm not sure that it's a country that inspires me, but it's certainly people. When I was a doctoral student, Dadi Taja was a destitute woman in Pakistan, where I did my doctoral field work. And she smoked bidi, the local cigarettes. She loved tea, and I love tea. She loved bindi, okra, the same vegetable I love. And um, she grew and harvested roses as an income generation project. Um, and so her life was a, a big inspiration for me there. Um, and. I must say there isn't a country where I couldn't name people who have been very inspiring and they could be people working in policy or they could be people in the communities. Um, but that's really where I draw a lot of energy and inspiration. And I'll give you one example um, of a younger person in India who he just finished his degree and he got hired by an experimental program in a regional government and he wanted to work on MPI. And so he did, and his boss gave him a, a chance to do an experimental MPI, and then it worked. And so the politician released it, and then he was invited to New York to present it in a side event of the General Assembly. And then later, he was hired, still as a very young person, by the national government to build their national MPI, and he continues to work there. And so it's it's very determined, very creative um, people who care that I find the most inspiring. Um, and I think that for me, it's a matter of always remembering that when you work on poverty, as Sir Tony Akin said, since said, it's different. You need to be able to motivate people and you need to be able to listen to their motivations. And what I find across countries, across um, settings is that the people who work on poverty often have a beautiful commitment, whether it comes, where it comes from varies, but that commitment is, is something that um, I, I really hold very precious. So thank you for the question. There is one question from uh, Cecilia. She would like to know how much uh, the pandemic has affected your activity in the field. No, that is a very good question. So in March, was the last time that uh, we could travel and actually my team were in Malawi and different places and we had to bring them home when the university stopped travel. But what we did was we found that we work on poverty in many countries and the people who were our colleagues 
were doing the COVID emergency response. And so we immediately pivoted to work with them um, on the data that they needed for COVID response, sometimes using micro simulations, sometimes computing vulnerability or doing different analyses. And so basically since March, it's been pretty nonstop for our research group, but we've not been able to travel. So we work virtually um, and we cannot go to the field to communities. And my research group is quite international. So by now they have all gone home. <laughs> they are no longer necessarily in Oxford because until we can get together again, there's not necessarily a reason to be together. Um, so it is, it's a very different feel. Um, I think all of us have experienced that of needing to meet people online. But what has been interesting has been that in many countries, because of the need to be online, the connectivity has been improved. Um, so where we are working, it's not perfect. Um, I'm, I should mention Afghanistan, which were the first country to update their MPI with post pandemic numbers and found a tiny but statistically significant decrease in poverty, whereas we had predicted a very large increase. So that was good news. But of course, the connectivity is is not so strong, but it exists. And what's up some of the non teams um, software are much easier uh, on the Internet bandwidth. So we use those a lot. Um, so I miss the field. We cannot wait to go back. Um, but for now, we are still working pretty actively um, with different governments. Matteo is asking, uh, I, I, I assume, uh, in the action to reduce poverty, is it better to finance directly the uh, governments of poor countries or uh, acting uh, through uh, international agency on the ground? No, that's a very good question. And it probably depends on the context um, and on the institutional strength and commitment of the government. But in our own case, we have made the decision to work with the government, but we also have criteria. We only work with governments who are committed to computing their own MP, who are not corrupt when it comes to measuring multidimensional poverty and who want to do indices that will survive elections and transitions of political party. So with those three conditions, we will work with the governments when it is possible. The advantage of working with governments is that they are there year in, year out, the civil servants. And you can't, in a sense, run a school system um, with three year grants and the multilaterals often have changing personnel, but their budgets often are not uh, confirmed except year by year. And so you need a little bit more stability um, to have, you know, long term health programs, employment programs, uh, education programs. So that's why we decided to work primarily with both national statistics organizations and then the policy actors nationally. Um, but that being said, in some countries, the international agencies play a beautiful role um, catalytically supporting and drawing attention to areas that need an extra bit of commitment. Thank you. There is a, uh, another question from the from the room. Uh, good morning, nice to meet you. I'm Andrea and thank you very much for your work. I really appreciate it. But today I think I have uh, an uncomfortable question. So I will I would like to ask that after witnessing criminal wars like the one in Iraq that caused hundreds of thousands of child deaths, invasion like the Chile of Allende and Nicaragua of Ortega, the pursued important social programs as Thomas Sankara did in Burkina Faso, or the tremendous exploitation in Congo for the extraction of coltan for our telephones, the various crises in Ye Yemen and the occupied Palestinian territories, especially in Gaza. Do you honestly believe that the great world nations are putting aside their geopolitical interests by ab abandoning the mentality of the last 150 years 
based on continuous pursuit of profit, unbridled consumption and exploitation, listening to the words of Amartya Sen. Thank you very much. No, thank you so much, Andrea. And that's a very good question. And I welcome hard, hard questions because they are what make us think hard. Um, and I think your question was an empirical. Do I think that this will work? Do I think that people will abandon their geopolitical agendas? No, I don't think that uh, that is necessarily the case. But I do think, as Amartya Sen has done throughout his career, that it is important for those of us in academia to always raise these issues. Um, and on that, I must say, as somebody who has watched him through the years, I am astonished how a man of his sophistication, who um, has a Nobel Prize and could do anything he wanted, continues to talk about the importance of putting children in school and of fighting undernutrition. Most academics get bored with poverty. They leave. They want to do something different. But he's stuck with it because it's still there and it needs his voice. And so I think that kind of commitment as an academic is an important one. I think the other is that there are possibilities of finding outstanding people. So we all know about outstanding people in the areas of peace, for example. Um, the Nelson Mandela's or the peace negotiators. Um, but sometimes we don't know so much about the people who have really brought change in terms of poverty reduction. But within a setting that might be have many geopolitical motivations, there can be people who push forward an agenda. I'll give you an example. In 2006, Nepal's peace accord was signed. Between 2006 and 2011, Nepal had the fastest reduction in MPI of 2.5 billion people, 34 countries. There was no Nelson Mandela. A lot of that period, Nepal did not have a government. What happened? A lot of the men were in the Middle East. They sent remittances back. But the women were in the villages and they sustained the investments in the social sectors during that period. So without having a wonderful hero you can celebrate on a big stage, there were still individual people that were pushing the right priorities. And so I think that that's the hope is that, yes, changing the big picture is way beyond me, but connecting with people who care and trying to support them to make the changes they can in different areas might be enough. Because as we said in the case of Britain, rationing food was not a complicated policy and yet it changed it changed people's lives um, and so it's these kinds of strategic but fundamentally straightforward uh, decisions that we're trying to encourage and we think that actually that could be enough to bring a historic change thank you sabina unfortunately i can just give you one last question because we have to stop here. So, the, but it is a very good question uh, to conclude from Marianna. So thank you, Arana, for this uh, nice question. What would you suggest that we do to take action against poverty in our everyday life? As long as informing ourselves and the people around us is of course extremely important. I feel it's not enough. I often find myself unable to take action since I don't know how or where to start? I know maybe that this is a, a silly question, I think it's not, but what would you suggest that we do even just to begin with? That's a perfect question for you. That's a fantastic question, Mariana. And with a colleague, Edmund Newell, at some point I wrote a book called What Can One Person Do? And it was inspired by a Pontius Puddle cartoon. And the cartoon had the world, and it had a lot of people who cared but felt they were just one person. And so they were raising up the cry, what can one person do? But of course there were billions of such people. And so we tried basically to study what kind of actions bring change and have brought change in the past. And some of the case studies were, for example, the abol abolition of slavery, where it took, you know, literally a citizen movement over 20 years. Um, it took lots of different actors working together and having a sustained interest. 
um, in that, but really being faithful to it, not giving up after one year or six months, um, but continuing and finding the strategic moments um, when they could put a voice out and bring change. So one option is to basically find an issue that you're passionate about and just follow it for five years, get involved. And as you get involved, there will be options for action that you will see and you will then be able to raise your voice. And that's very important, even in a friendly way for politicians. Uh, Frank Fields in the UK said, you know, please write to me because I want to do this. But if I have letters from my constituents, um, it helps me to be able to justify this for my critics who don't want me to do it. Um, and I think the other way is, you know, to look at the issues of the moment and then try to become one of those who continue to take action on a vase um, or on one of the other platforms. And so topically um, writing, those things really do matter. Um, and then building up relationships at the grassroots is another way. So whether it's a particular high school in a particular country that you then keep a long-term engagement with, um, that can be important um, as it's important for the individuals, it's important for them to have your response, your friendship, your concern, and, and that kind of, again, ongoing relationship. So most of what I would suggest is just sticking with a topic that's very passionate or a place that you're very in involved in. And if you don't, then just you know, recognizing that you may never see the fruit of your action, but one by one, uh, some of them will certainly uh, bring change, but you won't know which ones until after the fact. Thank you very much, uh, Sabina. And uh, I think that uh, also the questions and answer uh, session was very interesting for, uh, for all, all of us. Thank you for your availability and your great uh, presentation and discussion. Grazie a tutti per le domande. Mi dispiace che non possiamo uh, continuare. Ci sono molte altre domande sulla chat, ma non ce la facciamo in tempo. Quindi liberiamo um, Sabina Alcayer, così può tornare al suo lavoro in Bhutan. Uh, speriamo, I, f I hope that we can have you in Rome if uh, in the future, if the pandemic is over. And we, I, so. I invite you just uh, since now, because uh, uh, in the beginning, our initial idea was to invite you in Rome, but I understand now, now it's not possible. But in the future, I hope to, be, to, to have you here per in person. Yes, I would love uh, to come. <laughs> the, the university is deciding just in these days to repeat the experience of this course next year. So you are you are invited for next year. Thank you very Wonderful. much, really. Bye Thank bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Ragazzi, be <laughs> solo per concludere, beh, intanto gra grazie mille anche al professor De Muro, che tra l'altro di cui non ci libereremo tanto facilmente, perché sarà il discussant anche della prossima lezione che ci sarà eh, martedì, eh, non domani, martedì 16, nell'aula magna di lettere, nell'orario normale, cioè alle ore 17, e ci sarà la eh, dottoressa Marcella Villareal, che è una vice, vice direttore della FAO, che eh, ci parlerà appunto di quello che la FAO fa per quanto riguarda eh, il, il discorso sulla fame, parleremo di fame, di, di sottonutrizione. E Pasquale sa, av avrà lo stesso ruolo che ha avuto oggi. Un'ultima cosa, un cosa eh, rinnovo il ringraziamento a tutti gli studenti per tutte le domande, anche quelle naturalmente scomode, ma che sono in realtà non sono scomode, sono domande che fate bene a fare, dovete fare anche domande scomode, questo rende più interessante il tutto. Volevo dirvi, proprio per ricollegarmi ad alcune delle vostre domande, che Roma 3 è impegnata su questo obiettivo. Quindi siccome siamo, abbiamo concluso dicendo che cosa possiamo fare noi, voi dovete sapere che, a parte il vostro, le vostre, le vostre attività individuali, anche al di fuori della, della vostra vita universitaria, noi come Ateneo siamo impegnati su questo obiettivo, cioè oltre a insegnare e fare ricerca, perché appunto noi abbiamo la prima missione, 
la seconda missione e poi la terza missione. Come prima missione e seconda missione facciamo didattica e ricerca e noi facciamo didattica sulla povertà, ci sono diversi corsi che trattano questo argomento, facciamo ricerca, abbiamo diversi progetti di ricerca, ma sappiate che facciamo anche una terza missione, per esempio una cosa interessante che posso raccontarvi proprio per, per rispondere anche un po' ad alcune questioni, noi siamo impegnati in alcuni paesi africani come Roma 3 e facciamo dei progetti di cooperazione con le università locali per lavorare su questi problemi insieme a loro, insieme ai nostri colleghi africani, proprio in Burkina Faso, nello spirito di Sankara, per esempio, seguendo anche lo spirito dell'approccio che ha proposto Sabina Alcari, che è quello di Amartya Sen, cioè quello di considerare i poveri non come, eh, diciamo, um, come passivi recipienti di policy fatte dall'alto, ma usare i poveri come le, i primi strumenti per combattere contro la povertà, no? per mettere i poveri al centro proprio delle azioni di lotta alla povertà. E noi questo facciamo, uh, facciamo a Ouagadougou in, in, uh, in, uh, in Burkina Faso, cioè cerchiamo di capire come le conoscenze sviluppate dagli agricoltori poveri possono essere una leva per lo sviluppo rurale e quindi lavoriamo insieme agli africani, non portando dall'alto le nostre conoscenze, ma lavorando insieme a loro per sviluppare le loro conoscenze e applicarle al contesto locale, perché anche le conoscenze locali sono uno strumento fondamentale per lottare contro la povertà, nello spirito proprio di Thomas Sankara che è stato un grande leader africano. Eh, questo era solo un esempio, ovviamente facciamo tante altre cose, ci sono tanti altri progetti, ma come per dirvi che anche Roma 3 su questo è impegnata e sicuramente è un Ateneo che è sempre stata molto sensibile a questi temi. Vi saluto tutti e vi ringrazio per l'attenzione e la partecipazione.